The saw dudes are back. <laughs> the saw dudes. You know, Krishna is a cowboy. Was he? He's a cow herder. <laughs> I and mean, if he was in Texas, he'd be called a cowboy. Yeah. But he didn't ride a horse. <laughs> yeah, actually, I might be wrong. Maybe you have to ride a horse to be a cowboy. I think so. But you're still a cow herder. I mean, maybe. I mean, you could still be a. He's a shepherd. He has... I think it was cow herding, right? So yeah. not even sheep. Yeah, cow so. herd. Cow herd boy. So, I don't know. You just had a stick, you know. Maybe it's still cowboy. Can (laughs) listeners let us know? Can you be a cowboy if you aren't riding a horse? Christian's everything, so you can't be wrong. That's what I'm. That's what I'm banking on. The question that I'm coming into this conversation with, I would love. It's actually a handful of things. We're doing a little Sanskrit lesson. Uh Oh no, I'm terrible. (laughs) I don't know anything (laughs) about. Your Sanskrit's going to be much better than mine, and it still oh, will no. illuminate things for for uh, listeners. I I <laughs> was in so, the for, li- for listeners. I'm seeing <laughs> I'm seeing visual discomfort. <laughs> yeah. I no, no. I was in. You're giving me memories. There was a Sanskrit teacher in the ashram. Actually, there isn't physical discomfort. I would expect it based on. <laughs> when we've broached the topic of Sanskrit yeah. before, but for listeners to have an actual view, <laughs> you're as comfortable as, as usual. Yeah, I'm good, but I just had a memory of um, the Sanskrit teacher in the ashram in the 90s. Nice man, but um, yeah, it didn't go so well with me and him. <laughs> <laughs> and I was be like, I just couldn't, I couldn't be bothered to you know learn to read the alphabets i just wanted to get to the vocabulary already and um i still can't read the devanagiri script which is the actual script you know like on beckham's arm you know i like that script i still am not very good at reading it so after like a week of me and that guy not getting on so well uh, (laughs) i was walking on the jogging track with swamiji and we walked by the lecture hall and it I, I remembered what's going on. I said, Swamiji, the Sanskrit thing, look, you know, like, I know it's profound and I know it's amazing, but I trust your translation. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, that's fine. You forget about it. I was like, mm-hmm. thank God. <laughs> so, and there's a, there's probably a lot of people out there. Someday they're going to hear this and be like, they're going to write me off because of my lack of Sanskrit chops, but that's okay. Write me off. It's all <laughs> good. You're probably right. But, um, yeah. So I only know a bit of vocabulary and uh, those words that I I want to know. <laughs> Do you mind um, telling listeners a little bit about the significance of Sanskrit and and uh, yeah, the I mean no. So in all jokes aside, like I mean, it is an incredible language. It, it's said to be like an ideal language for science and commute from computers and somehow coding and stuff because it's all like. It's all like pieces. It's like nodes. It's like it's like it's, music keys yeah, and things that yeah. Yeah, the way it it can all fit together in different angles and w- w- the way normal languages can't. It's really versatile and mathematical and scientific. It's kind of like I don't know. It's like the blockchain or something. It just all mm. makes a lot of sense. So the original scriptures, the Upanishads, which are the literal Vedanta, end of the Vedas, were spoken presumably and written in in sanskrit when they were written down and uh that sanskrit um there's a lot of the south indian language south asian languages that are clearly related to sanskrit like hindi for example and probably others that i'm showing my ignorance about but we enjoy direct sanskrit to english translations so In Vedanta, in this philosophy, we really are only one degree removed from the original word. And so, you know, there are teachers that say you have to know the Sanskrit, otherwise you can't know the philosophy. And you have to not only know it, but you have to know the correct pronunciation of it. And if you don't chant it in exactly the right way, then the intonational value that was meant will not do something to you at some level that, you know, like you need it to happen for your spiritual growth. So yeah, the Sanskrit has 
an incredible construction. Uh, it's profound. It's extremely versatile. Um, but at least my view and, and like jokes aside, I mean, I, I'm never going to be proficient to read it as I can read English. And I have a guru who uh, spent thousands and thousands of hours laboring over each word and why it's translated the way it's translated with not only word by word, but in context of that verse and in context of that chapter and in context of the whole book and in context of the whole philosophy, all that, I surrender to that. For me, uh, Sanskrit is a full life study. I mean, it's uh, lifetimes, you know, uh, and th those people that have it, it's great. And it's it's really wonderful to have Sanskrit knowledge. But ultimately, it's it's, again, an intellectual thing. And it's like, we're trying to get to the vision of the truth uh, as quickly and deeply and directly as possible. And I think you can do it without knowing a word of Sanskrit, mm -hmm. just with English or whatever your language is. But all that being said, Sanskrit has a power. It has a, it has a something inherent in it that I'm sure is there that I don't fully understand, but I know some words. I do know some. You know and, a lot more than some and, words. And some verses. <laughs> well, the reason I want to go through a few different Sanskrit words, really, it's just uh, a few different concepts, but using the Sanskrit words, but also touch on that um, the significance of Sanskrit is just to underscore what you said. It's the original language, the verses, the text is in the original language that it was oral tradition and then a written tradition for thousands of years and it has not changed and you mistranslate one word one verse one idea much less then it's translated again and again mm -hmm. so the bible for example you're reading a version here in the u.s in in english that was translated from old english into modern english it was translated from uh, Latin into Old English that was translated from Greek to Latin that was translated from uh, Aramaic mm -hmm. to Greek. You've got five degrees of telephone. Mm -hmm. And famously, one of the most famous examples that we only, that it was only recognized about 40 years ago is uh, Christ's first words, uh, metanoiate. We took it as um, repent and uh, his first public words, uh, and metanoiate means overcome your mind. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it was St. Jerome mm -hmm. um, in f around 400 AD that mistranslated it from Greek into wow. Latin. And overcome your mind. Overcome your mind. Shh. And uh, metanoiate is, you know, over mind, uh, over your mind. Wow. And we took it as uh, repent. I mean, it, it, leading to generations of destruction and, and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's so amazing. That, so that significance of, of being like, oh, yeah. wow, that's the that's what they actually, original, that's yeah. what they said. Yeah. And then you can still have debates in your own modern language of how you would interpret that into your modern language, but there's yeah. only one degree versus five. Yes. Of chances to where you don't even get back you you cannot even reference the original because mm -hmm. you're talking about it in english and then latin and no one even we still don't have the original of the aramaic hmm. yeah wow yeah it's it's the original language that the sages gave the knowledge in and and we get to go to it directly and uh, there may be some power in the language itself that I just don't understand or that I haven't been taught that people claim that also, you know, that certain words have um, certain like resonances and certain energetic powers and all that, which is cool. And I don't well, doubt it. I just don't know it. Dude, this is why yeah. I wanted to have yeah. this episode is yeah. because there are certain words that I'll hear in Sanskrit and I have no interest. I, I'm <laughs> um, a modicum of interest yeah. <laughs> in learning um, Sanskrit, but no more than a atomic modicum mm. um, and yet these words dance in my head mm. like music 
Yeah. In a way that no words, mm. English words don't oh, dance yeah. in my head, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Spanish words you know, mm. don't dance in my head this mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, they they hit something. They hit something. And so... so yeah, they, I mean, literally they're... You know, and like there is a... There's, art's not even the word. I mean, there are entire spiritual sadhanas set up around people learning to chant Sanskrit in precise, particular ways and meters and volumes and sound. I mean, it is an entire sadhana in itself. And uh, I'm all for the idea that uh, chanting and and rituals and things have a, a lasting impact on the ether, for lack of a better word. I mean, there's there's an energy to them for sure. I just I just don't know what it is. I don't know how to describe it. You know. Well, and and this will not be a scholastic conversation. It'll be much more around um, the uh, principles and concepts. But first one that dances around in my head often is uh, Viveka Chudamani. Mm. Um, that's at least recently. There are others that have been. A bit more. It's a great one. Huh? Timeless, but could you walk us through? Uh, yeah, the crown jewel of discernment, the crest jewel, crest jewel of discrimination. Could it be discernment as well? Possibly. I don't see why not. But yeah, same. It's the crest jewel of discrimination or discernment. But yeah, I've okay. always seen it translated as discrimination. Yeah, that it could be. This is why you are yeah, no, my it, teacher. It's so okay. cool, man. Yeah, the crest jewel, meaning it's like the Viveka Chudamani is like the the pinnacle jewel on the crown of of an instrument for discriminating uh, nitya anitya viveka vichara. The... the Vedanta is described in four words as nitya, anitya, viveka, vichara. Real, unreal, discriminate, inquire. Inquire into and discriminate between the real and the unreal. That, that's, that is Vedanta, is the practice of trying to sieve out what's lasting in this experience or what's lasting in me or what's lasting in existence itself. Is there something lasting? The moment you're able to discriminate it, you're you know it. The moment you're able to separate the waker from the dreamer, you're awake. The only one who can, or to put it the other way, the only one who can actually do that discrimination is the waker. So Viveka Chudamani is a text by Adi Shankaracharya that is just so in-depth and particularly... um, incisive in how it describes reality versus unreality, how it constantly discriminates between what's the reality and what is the superimposition upon reality. It uses that word a lot in Viveka Chudamani. It uh, it just, yeah, it's it's like- it's and what is sp- real and what is the illusion? Yeah. Placed on top of reality. On top of reality. Superimposed. He he uses that word a lot. That's how it's translated, actually. The word he uses a lot is translated as superimposition. Superimpo- and just that book is, uh, it's just like the sharpest scalpel. It's such a scalpel. It's such a wicked sharp scalpel for discriminate. You study it and you can just, you can almost see what's changing, what's changeless. In fact, uh, Swami considered that book as part of our uh, syllabus at the Vedanta Academy. But it would have added two years <laughs> to do it justice. So the course would have been three years, not three years, it would have been five years. And he was like, who's going to come for five years? Which is funny because a lot of us <laughs> ended up staying a lot longer, but if at the get-go, when you're going to join the course, you're like, five years? What the hell, man? You know, mm-hmm. that's, that just sounds a lot longer than three years. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. And and, and I am and I could be giving a really sort of like half, you know, joking. I don't know exactly. I just heard Swami mention that he considered it in this little anecdote about five years. There could be a more conceptual considerations about why he didn't include it, but it's it's up there with the Gita. For sure. It's just newer. 
uh, like around 800, maybe yeah. 700, yeah. 880. Yeah. And the Viveka Chudamani, so it just in that title, the Crest Jewel, uh, you know what I think it is? Mm. I think I've seen it written as discernment, maybe in more recent uh articulations because discrimination is like a uh, touchy yeah word. so talk about the failings of translation you're yeah you're just up to the whims of what's in fashion and not in fashion to translate the you know words but oh for sure so discriminating and and discernment which are close but why would that be the crown jewel or the crest jewel of the crown well no the viveka chudamani is of the, the tools used to do the discrimination, you could take it as like, it is the crest jewel. It is like the bee's knees, that particular text. Oh, the text is the... Yeah. I mean, actually, I've never thought about it. That's how I always took it. <laughs> I was I, I was thinking like, oh, if, if there was like a crown jewel of ideals to cultivate, to... Could be. Work towards... Could be. I mean, I always took it as like, this is the of the tools of discrimination to help you with that discernment. Viveka Chudamani is the you know the Kohinoor diamond of them, mm. you know. But um, oh, interesting. But it could be what you're saying that it's referring to. I don't know. I'll go read the intro when I get back home <laughs> and find out. <laughs> could it? Could you could one say that there's uh, make a case for discernment as the the central? Oh yeah, it's the intellect. crown jewel of yeah of the eternal principles for sure. I mean, the whole thing really is separating reality from unreality. The moment we do that, we're done. As soon as you know the real aspect of yourself, you instantly understand it in everyone else, and. That's what you you function as that interacting with that. There is no other. That is the highest. The whole thing is just trying to, uh, not just, is trying to sieve out the eternal, infinite, unmanifest sat, existence, part of yourself. And the, the moment we do that, we understand it equally in the world. That's the whole thing. This philosophy, it's one of the many reasons this philosophy is so badass to reflect on. Mm. And so incredible in comparison to most philosophical worldviews and it's quite i mean it's not quite it is so compatible it is compatible it is the it's the heartbeat of mm. every other worldview mm -hmm. um but the heartbeat gets discarded for the lifeless body when you're handed here are ten commandments mm -hmm. when you're commanded to do something mm. command someone to do anything mm. much less ten times over or the old testament having over 600 laws to it. Mm -hmm. None of them, none of the 10 commandments have anything to do with cultivate your ability to discriminate, to discern mm. what should be done in this mundane moment, much less what is important in the profound. It's mm. literally, you know, don't worship any idols. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it gets down to such a elementary i'm going to tell you what to do what to eat what not to eat what on. to eat what to not what not to eat and yeah. and in, and it's has so little to do with cultivate your own capacities yeah, yeah. It's just here are rules and then shit will work out for you if you just follow these rules right instead of something as as uh profound seemingly abstract but as profound as um Cultivate your capacity to discern real from the unreal, which is something you could obviously reflect on for 40 years. Oh, yeah. It's like, well, what the hell is real? Unreal? Can I discern it? Oh, my God. My last 24 hours, last 24 years, I have been caught up in so many things that I know mm. right now were not real. Mm -hmm. Can yeah. I take another swing at it today with a yeah. slightly elevated yeah. consciousness? Yeah. 
and then tomorrow and the next day or sure in this very moment like it's a, it's it's life's work in yeah, front of you with what's that. actually what is actually going on hmm. and that's the thing it's right in front of us all the time like what's actually happening right now in any moment whenever someone's listening to this yeah there is consciousness awareing perceptions emotions and thoughts of a personality that's walking around that is superimposing its likes and dislikes onto a substratum of existence and those things are interacting and somehow we i this is involved in this particular guy versus you and you're involved in this particular your particular guy instead of my thing is like it's just bizarre and and um illusory but the the ocean in which it's happening the consciousness in which it's happening uh is is real is there because if it wasn't then we couldn't have superimpositions and we couldn't have there'd be nothing to be ignorant of mm. so this is the kind of reflection that uh that you get in these great texts it is um too simple that's the problem it's too simple for our complicated intellects to understand it's like in our last episode telling someone to do nothing yeah anyone will think that they can do nothing it's impossible we are all involuntarily just it's too simple pushing Mm. Yeah, yeah, knowing when to stop. I think we quoted that the Zen master described Zen as knowing when to stop. Mm. It's it's not it's when's not the problem really. It's how. I mean, just to be able to not complicate things any further than they are. It takes even that takes just tremendous discernment. So you know, this is why like you have to respect people who you know, just authentically get into simplicity. It shows they're at least making an effort to not be a victim of that endless um, superimposing mind that's adding layers and layers of nothing on top of nothing. It's, it's, uh, it's incredible. People are marveling at uh, right now online. Uh, someone seeing that Peter Thiel, best tech investor of all time, perhaps, uh, Still has an iPhone 8. Uh, and we're working on like iPhone 15 or something. <laughs> That's the dumbest example, but it's captivated a whole oh, yeah. sector. Uh, yeah. And in the audience on online, you know, on Twitter, uh, that he has an iPhone 8. He, he's resi- he hasn't even gotten <laughs> the iPhone 12. Like yeah. it's so... It's funny. It's so incredible to people yeah. that he hasn't just bought it latest phone, much less um, anyone that's chosen. So to your point of it's so admirable when people choose simplicity um, voluntarily. I think I've quoted this before on the podcast, but our, our beloved Swami, um, I remember telling you this multiple times, but just one day sitting in his living room watching cricket in the afternoon in Bombay, <laughs> peaceful afternoon watching cricket with the Swami. He looks at me, he goes, out of the blue. I mean, we've been watching cricket for like an hour and a half. He goes, you know why I'm so great? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, who says that? You know, it's such an awesome thing. Uh, You know why I'm so great? And I was kind of (laughs) like, no, Swami. I mean, I could guess, you know, all the things I haven't done. And then we watch cricket for another hour and a half. And I'm quoting it now, 20 years later, because it hit me like a ton of bricks then, and it's still incredible. All the things you don't do, all the things you just let pass, yeah. it takes discernment. It, I think it takes discernment first, you know, because then you're just like, that's more of that. Nay, mm-hmm. nay, nay, nay. Nate, Nate, not that. That's more of that. Dude, that's more of that. You're bringing up 
It's a good segue. We'll touch on it in a second. It's the next. It's a good one. Yeah. Well, it was going to be the one after this next one, but Neti Neti is going to yeah. be one of them. But okay, keep going. Yeah, no. So Neti Neti just means not that, not that. So that does not require my attention. <laughs> that does not require my investment. That does not require, no, Neti, Neti, Neti. We were in Aspen in 2008 at the Aspen Fe Ideas Festival. And <laughs> Swami was sitting there watching tennis. Sounds like he always watches sports, but <laughs> he does enjoy sports. But you know, he's sitting there watching tennis. He's a speaker at the festival. And uh, it's the last day or the night before the last day. And Bill Clinton is doing a fireside chat with somebody under a big tent, you know, maybe a few hundred people. It's a pretty intimate Thing. And 2008, Clinton was still really a, a big player in things. And, um, you know, everyone's hurrying to go. You can see the whole place is like flocking to this tent to go, you know. And uh, I went to Swami's room. And, Swamiji, hi. Uh, uh, just to let you know, uh, Bill Clinton is about to speak and it seems like everyone's going there. He's kind of looked at me and looked at the tennis and then looked back at me. He goes, uh, why don't you boys go? <laughs> I was <laughs> like, of course. And we went. And, you know, it, it, we did what we did. Um, it's uh, just this discernment. Discernment. Yeah. Like what, you know, I'm I'm, I'm good. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to watch. I'm going to watch tennis. To, to our last episode of uh, episode on control, that discernment. Or the effects seem like they take effort, like discipline. Like mm -hmm. uh, it could be as simple as like, um, wow, going to bed early, mm. waking up early, mm. uh, routines. And yet for those people in the, in the midst of them, that discernment is, it's, it's probably super clear accounting of like, yeah, what, why would I do that? Yeah, so, yeah, for sure, to build on that episode, I mean, discernment is the spearhead. Discernment is intellect. Yoga for your intellect sharpens the scalpel of discernment. It allows us to penetrate and and very subtly understand what to do and what not to do at all levels. Like, okay, overtly eat that, don't eat that. Like, this is the dumbest, the biggest, obvious example, but... More than that, like what kind of thoughts to entertain, what type of emotions to entertain, what type of relationships to entertain. I see startup founders have look at fifteen hundred deals a year, and and it's it's specifically when it's um, friends of friends, hmm. where I've got to jump on a call and they're telling me the startup that they're going to pursue, and it's like my high school friends. Uh, spouse, so I'm going to do it as a as, as a favor. Otherwise, I wouldn't even like give commentary on a bad wave. But right, right. they'll talk about the startup that they're going after, and I'll be thinking that is a terrible wave to ride. Huh? Huh? Terrible wave. Like, why yeah. would you do why that? Why would you go for that? That's yeah. A, yeah. That's going to be so um, gnarly. Mm. And and I can tell they're not even like going into uh, some crazy scenario for a higher ideal they're really much of the time it's financial engineering I'm like that that's going to wipe you out you're going to be mm. out five years of your life and in debt when you get done with that going riding that wave mm. but and i'll mention that in a euphemistic way to them and in, in some uh polished way and that's polite but yeah they just don't listen they, they if no they don't know from 15 years of building things and right. and investing in 200 companies, I'll see these things, um, these patterns, and they don't they don't know, and they're like, nope, I'm riding this wave, mm. and they'll learn. Yeah, and that's it, and that's kind of the they say, uh, good judgment comes I mean, from you, we experience, all, and experience comes. You from get discernment from yeah, yeah judgment. experience. It'd be great if we get it all from knowledge, but most of us have to bungle up a lot of stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> to be like. Okay, think next time. The uh, man, we could spend so much time on on discernment, and that probably deserves its own episode at some mm -hmm. point. I, a few of these other Sanskrit words that play around in my 
head is uh is one well i'm going to talk about bungling i'm going to mess up some of these and i'm going to get to uh neti neti is one of them but um chandra shakanaya chandra shakanaya yeah chandra shakanaya nyaya 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 okay um the moon branch the moon branch analogy yeah do you mind elucidating Mm. on that chandra shaka nyaya so knowledge moves from the known to the unknown uh i am a terrible surf instructor (laughs) you you you're not the first to tell me (laughs) there have been a few who've told me now so it must be true if you want to learn surfing, I can't help you. <laughs> no, not terrible. <laughs> Pretty not bad. good. Not good. But yeah. not terrible. Yeah, not terrible. It's funny because my buddy in Australia who first took me surfing was totally terrible. And I hope he listens to this. So I must get it from him. But uh, we went out surfing one day and he was so bad. He didn't help me at all. So <laughs> to help somebody surf, you got to tell them like, this is your board. <laughs> This leash keeps the board attached to you when you fall off the board. And like, you know, really known to the unknown. You can't just tell someone. So once you get up, mm-hmm. <laughs> then turn right, you know, which is more my problem, my style. It's bad teaching. So Chandra Shaka Nyaya is moon branch analogy. And it disc- it's, it's talking about Vedanta is the role of Vedanta the way Vedanta moves from the known to the unknown is the way is similar to pointing out a new moon on a bright blue sky day where you're out hiking and you see just like a sliver of the moon and uh, you see it, but it's a big blue sky and there's clouds. So it's like, you're not able to see and you want to tell the person you're with, Hey, see the, see the moon and they say no what moon no no there where see the tree on the on the end of the trail yeah see the top of the tree there's that that one branch yeah see at the end of the branch there's a dead leaf there hanging there yeah look up from there ah chandra shakanyaya so vedanta is like the moon branch analogy is used to explain how vedanta works and that's how it works. That's how this discernment works. We cannot grasp the self, the consciousness, the reality that we are, that we is, that is now. We can't grasp it with our intellect. We cannot feel it with our hearts, with our emotions. We definitely cannot see it, smell it, taste it, touch it, hear it with our senses. But Vedanta does have a way of pointing us strongly, firmly in the direction of the self, which is within, with it, which is what we refer to as I am. In the same way that when you look at the tree, the moon branch analogy, when you look at the tree and the branch and the leaf, it points at the moon. The, bra- the, the tree, the branch, the leaf have nothing to do with the moon. They certainly don't reach the moon. They, there is no commonality between the branch and the leaf and the, none of it with the moon. And yet, it serves as an effective way to look in the direction of the moon. So Vedanta per se is not the reality. Vedanta is not the consciousness, is not Brahman. But it does have a way of pointing us in the direction. It's a it's a collection of, you could say it's a collection of pointers that takes us in the direction of reality. And then you have to, you know, put in all the efforts to get to that, that state where it is um, self-cognized. The Viveka Chudamani, in fact, says the Atman is cognized, is self-cognized because it is cognized by itself. <laughs> of course. Of course. That's one verse. Incredible. But it makes a lot of sense. It's Mm self-cognized. But we don't know anything that's self-cognized. Everything is cognized by a subject and object relationship. So 
to 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 have something that is the reality that cognizes itself this is beyond the intellect but even talking about it with these wor- these words we're using are not the self even right now the self is the self but these words can in some way help to move us in the direction of that unknown relatedly you going a little off script from the the words that I want to cover you mentioned uh, nitya nitya viveka and what is inquiry vichara vichara yeah um do you mind talking a little bit about inquiry and how that its role in inquiring into and discriminating between the real and the unreal so literally inquiring asking who am i and then discriminating am i this body well i don't i don't this body was different 10 years ago and will be different 10 years from now am i these emotions these this is inquiry I was um, asking, my brother's birthday yeah. today is fifth he's it's his 50th and i was just asking him uh-huh. this morning how how old do you feel and and we were kind of remarking that it's a convention that you're 50 years old you are yeah some number um yeah. that's just a made-up social convention yeah to track i mean it's like inches yeah um <laughs> versus and yet we're we're kind of told like that's the reality you're 50 how do you feel oh you might yeah. feel yes. 25 yeah, yeah but that's not correct right you're 50 instead of maybe it's the flip of y- you are not your body you're not 50 years old you're not defined by some age or some limitation in your limbs totally and it's a great that see there's a good question of inquiry that's a good example of inquiry how old do i feel <laughs> it's a <laughs> it's a really good starting point actually i i don't feel old or not old i feel yeah. like i exist mm, right that itself is a, a heck of a clue <laughs> you know why does everyone feel that way also it's kind of funny mm-hmm why is it that even when people are dying all over the place in movies and stuff, it's like you don't really think, can I die? That's an inquiry. And discriminate between the real and, really? You really think you can just not exist? Hmm. I don't, nobody really gets down with that idea. You know, because essentially you are eternal. Essentially, you are infinite. You are not in time, space, and causation. The body, mind, intellect is in time, space, and causation. Even the worst criminal, you know, am I permanently evil, terrible? Who am I? This is all, this is all inquiry. Inquire Mm. into, ask these questions, and discriminate between the real. And these, these books, we can try and do it from scratch, like, you know, sit down in your armchair and try to reason your way to the self, or we can take the trainer and go to the gym where it's like these people have been doing it for 5,000 years and they know what type of questions, what type of analysis, what type of thinking is the most direct to getting you into that jnana chakshu, mm-hmm. that, that vision and there you have to do, there there's no communication. Even if you go to Swami, you're like, I've got it, Swami. I've, I think I've seen it, you know. And nobody knows what anybody else is saying. You can't. Okay. <laughs> if you say so, you know, like, um, then it has to be self-cognized. The only truth that will really matter is the one that you see yourself in the end. Even mm-hmm. if someone comes and tells you, James, you, you got it. I think you got it, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's the difference between telling me about surfing and surfing. They're not... It's kind of like, okay, even thanks, you know? Like, you know, oh, you must be a rich man. Someone comes and tells a guy, you must be, you're such a rich man. Okay, that's fine. But am I or not? It, it, only when you decide you're a rich man, are you a rich man? <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, for example, similarly, the Vedanta can tell you and and... The knowledge can tell us that you are that infinite consciousness. This is, you are not this limited being and all that. 
But ultimately, it matters that you know that for yourself. And once you know that for yourself, you're made. You're that's like the ultimate made person. They're done at that point. You you have the confidence. It's like security. Hmm. It's like some people have. My God, do you know you need to have four houses and 87 401ks and 25 mutual funds and 87 bonds and then you're okay. Uh, but Ramatirtha just had like a cloth around him and he was totally secure. So these are Chandra Shaka, Nyaya, Vedanta. These are objective tools, objective methods to bring about a subjective apprehension of mm-hmm. the reality. And once you know what you are, really, even even in, even on a level of a profound intellectual contemplation, it doesn't matter what happens after that. Well, you know, it really doesn't. You you could end up in almost any circumstance, and you may not be on the surface happy with it, but deep down, you're in contact with the part of yourself that's ever always okay. Next word is acharya. Hmm. Acharya means like teacher. Like Swami Parthasarathy is the chief acharya of Vedanta Academy. Oh, well then that shows how bad I've bungled Sanskrit. Oh, what what, what about wonderment? Ascharya. Ascharya. There yeah, yeah. we go. <laughs> okay, Ascharyas. Yeah. Ast- and uh, obviously I'm uh feigning we're learning Sanskrit we're really just touching on some of these the uh, words core we principles. Like. Yeah, core principles, but Ascharya um could you walk us through wonderment and its role within Vedanta? Yeah, Ascharya is is um, wonderment related to humility. That that sense of oh my god when you see something is it related to inquiry? No. Okay. Uh, I mean, they're not. All these things are set. I mean, you could be inquiring out of wonder, or or you know. Um, what is that? What is that totality? Oh my God! Then you're inquiring based on wonder. That way, they could be related. But yeah, oh, yeah. Feel, but yeah, you can be harsh. No, 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 no. Concessions I, no, or no, anything. No, it's true. No, like they could be related. They could be both going on. In fact, it's probably great. Like um, the height of meditation is is really paying attention to silence. You know, ultimately. But before that, to get into that state. There has to be uh, a single-pointed, wondrous, awe-filled submission to truth. You know, just staggering wonder and awe and uh, at the fact that things is. I mean, there there is nothing more. Just what the heck? That that is it. I mean, the fact that things is. So. So cool! It's that it's a core principle of yeah. of a philosophy is this wonderment. Yeah, wonderment at that at the very fact that things is, and out of it, you know, there's gratitude and and not for me or for, not for a person in particular, but just like this awe, wonder, gratitude. It's it's a it you have to have that feeling at some stage. Ultimately, it's to get into the state of pure silence and consciousness, which is beyond all this. That's why I started with that, but. To get there, the whole personality has got to be just offered into that truth, you know. Just and and ascharya is, you know, like the opposite of demanding. It's it's just like this state of inspired wonder. It's like you paddle out on a big day and the surf is just perfect, and the offshores are blowing it, the hair off the top of the waves, and it's just what? Like what is this? jewel that we live on in the middle of a void and we're riding energy around the mm-hmm. planet it's just like what is this it's a, there's no room for any desire and any there's no complaints in that state the, which is a really quiet state of mind that intellect that personality in that state is one full of ascharya of wonder and the intellect is governing the whole thing pointing it in the, the highest direction. I mean, I give like surfing as an example, but I mean, a person in Australia may be just sitting quietly at their desk under a lamp at 4.30 in the morning. And you won't even, 
you did just some verse out of the Gita or Viveka Chudamani is just they're just lit up at the fact that consciousness exists. That's it doesn't have to be any expression at all. It just makes it easier to say like, you know, when you're walking by the Himalayas for the first time and you just go, oh my God, you know, what is that? You know? It's it's interesting that there's there's uh, it feels like there's a distinction between wonderment and curiosity and that to be curious is almost desiring to know it's uh yeah observational gaps with a desire to know mm. versus wonderment is observational gaps and I'm saying i can't know right i don't know not only do i i don't know but i can't know mm. at the reality even at ignorance ignorance itself can you can be in in a state of ascharya we typically think of it as like for the higher but you could even be in in wonder at the beginninglessness of our ignorance i mean he talks about in the gita he says it's anadi it has no beginning another beautiful beautiful sanskrit word anadi it's it's without beginning it's both beginningless and mitya and illusory. <laughs> like that you can get into Ascharya. The intellect just it fails to comprehend. So it's related to humility, to bhakti. A bhakta is, is, bhakti is saying, I don't know. I can't know. So it's more on the bhakti. Ascharya, you would bring up more on like the bhakti devotional side of just, when you think about things deeply enough, you realize, I don't know. Mm. I don't know anything about anything. And would you say it's more bhakta because it's it's on the dualistic? No, no, side not of but not in that way. More bhakti in the sense of like it's more at the heart level. It's it's a surrender. It's a, an attitude of I don't know. It's a recognition of the futility of the possibility of ever understanding it. Mm. It's not it, it, you can't know it at all with the intellect. And the, the 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 mind just says, I, "I surrender. I don't know." This is bhakti yoga, actually, the so it, deeper way of understanding bhakti yoga. It's kind of surrender. It's also it seems like kind of love of a mystery of the mystery of. Yes, in the in the sense that you um, there's a merging with it, right? And uh, a, and a, I guess yeah. the emphasis being on the mystery part, like it's yeah the, it. Love that there are these observational gaps that yeah, I can't know. Yeah. Uh, there's um, not I need to know. I like, can't. Wow. It's too big. This is so. So vast. Vast and beautiful. And mm. there's, uh, this is maybe just my own interpretation, that, but a feeling of love of this ever elusive mystery that cannot be grasped. Yeah. And a love of the fact that it cannot be grasped, almost of just the, if I grasped it, there would, the wonderment would be gone. Right. Its vastness would be gone. Yeah. Right. So Ascharya is like a surrender, identification with the, the unknowable. This, this is a more philosophical way of saying love, which same thing you're saying. But yeah, being absorbed. Mm. in it and being solved in it like the like the solution you get solved in a solution mm. like a, it's everything is solved in it yeah and so that profundity that that wonder at that that humility that all that feelings governed by the intellect yeah that's a cool phrase of identification with the unknown mm. um and in a very mundane example it's like being really good at you know, mastering a craft to where your mastery matches your tastes mm -hmm. and you like surfing a great wave where you just you're like wow i can't believe i just did that mm -hmm. but you did it there's mm -hmm. an identification with mm -hmm. i have no idea how i did that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or how that happened or what came together mm -hmm. to make that feel effortless or while you're doing it to where you're like, this is both me and so not anything I've ever uh, thought of as me. 
Mm. Like I cannot even grasp how this is being done. This is obviously a very mundane example. No, but yeah. Mastering yeah. a craft and being like, I want to thank my four generations of uh, ancestors that have allowed for this experience mm. to to create what like I think about that in entrepreneurship all the time of mm. creating companies of four generations of entrepreneurs I, I think and that goes back to Yo-Yo Ma I think saying uh, it takes three generations to produce a world class musician not that world class anything but I do think about the dinner conversations when I was seven years old about business leaders mm. that I obviously had no a part in creating that environment mm. that fostered such mm. conversations mm. for 20 years before starting things. Mm. But something's going well and I'm like, I don't, there's, it would take me an attorney to try to understand mm. why that is happening the way it's happening and unfolding. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 what it is, trying to understand. Like that's the opposite of Australia. Mm. If you think of like what the Australia is that wondrous surrender, allowing oneself to be absorbed in the vastness of it, of whatever it is. Um, that in combination with the uh, intellect monitoring and holding the attention on that thing the you can't do anything more than that you've got the whole personality at that point aimed in one direction you know mm. and at that that is what's required versus the idea that oh i i, I think we can understand this yeah mm. oh that's pretty cool but i think i know what this is actually going on i think this is one in a bunch of universes and something something some answer you know? uh, we, and we live in such a scientific age <laughs> yeah. that is overcorrected yeah. um, from prior ages where it's like, well, where's the proof? Yeah. It's that um, H.L. Mencken quote that I keep quoting all the time. He says, uh, penetrating so many secrets, we cease to believe in the unknowable. But there it sits, nevertheless, licking its chops. Hmm. I love that. That's so cool. Like, mm. yeah, because we're like, okay, we can put A380s in the air and do my, do zooms and replace legs and all kinds of crazy stuff we can do nowadays. Penetrating so many secrets. So we forget there's something fundamental that we can't know. It's unknowable. And the more we keep trying is lack of wonder. Mm. I'm not saying we shouldn't make the world better. We should. But to, to, the wrong direction is trying to pursue it without wonder, without surrender, without that, like, I can't know what that is. It's too vast. It's too vast. That humility, that surrender, that awe is a, is essential for the journey. The last Sanskrit words for today's lesson on Sanskrit. <laughs> neti neti. Yeah. Now I think it's probably Nati Nati. Nati Nati. Well, guess what? You know, and, things pronunciation and neti, sometimes neti. change. If you've seen some of the language on TikTok, Nati Nati is like, new words. It's like two pots, two neti pots. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Na that is what I think about neti yeah, pots. Yeah. yeah uh, neti Nati. Nati Nati. Yeah. And again, I've got, I can think of 10 Indian friends who are laughing at my pronunciation of it right now. So it's all good. Listen, hey, it's not it's not actually it's progress that matters. Yeah. And uh like Balin, he'll listen to these someday. Who knows? And he just he's always just like, bro, just don't don't even say anything in Sanskrit. <laughs> and to him I'd reply with uh yeah. listen, it's <laughs> progress that we've made as Texans. Oh uh, yeah. It's yeah, not, right. totally. Yeah, man. I came from Houston. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, how so how can I pronounce Nati Nati? Yeah, so Nati Nati, not that, not that. So anytime the student would go to the master, they would get some something to reflect on, some concept to sit with and reflect on and transcend and reach the reality, like a koan, similar. Anyway, 
any of these ideas, they were given in ancient days in the Himalayan valleys. And they would go off and reflect in their own, you know, student cave and come back to the master and say, I, I think I've got, I think I've understood. Like, I think I know. This is, this is what it is. This is, I had this experience or I had this thought or whatever. And I, this is the truth. And the master would say, Nati, Nati. Not that, not that. And then he'd tell him something else. And the student would go away. And then he'd come back after a while. Same thing. Okay, now I see. This is what it is. Nathan, Nathan. Not that, not that. Then he would tell him something else. And the student never came back. So the way Swami tells it is that is the, the master then would know that that person understood. Because the idea is anything we say about what reality is, is Nati Nati, because it can't be said. Mm. So anything we think we know about what is actually going on, or what is, is Nati Nati. It's not that, not that. Ultimately, this path boils down to negation. Ultimately, you drop all conceptual everything. Um, all constructs and everything and surrender to the silence. And in that silence, you find yourself, he says. So nothing that we can ever say can ever be that, can ever be a correct representation of that, because it's not representable. Therefore, it's all nati nati in that way is the highest teaching very incisive tool in terms of what our understanding is of the truth keep saying no no not that and maybe it's that no maybe it's that no maybe it's that no Nati, Nati. is there some connection between discrimination discernment and not this not this yeah it's the highest the highest discernment, discrimination is, no, not that, not that, not that, not that. What's left is the truth. Once everything has been not thatted. Once everything has been not thatted. What's left seems like nothing, but that nothing is something. More than that, that nothing is everything. A total Formless. shift. Yeah. A total shift in values. Total shift in values. That verse in Atma Bodha, Nirguno, Nishkriyo, Nityo, Nirvikalpo, Niranjanaha, Nirakara. It's near, 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 near. I mean, no, 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 no. The whole verse is describing Brahman, reality, consciousness, the self. And it gives like eight words that start with not this, no form, no shape, no quality, no dirt, no nothing. And no, 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 no. It can't be positively described because it has no qualities. Mm. How do you describe something that has no qualities positively? You don't. So nati nati. Yeah. And so if anybody comes and asks you, hey, James, I think I've understood this as a reality. You can always be right by saying nati nati. <laughs> Not that. Mm. What about learning like thousand lines of Sanskrit what about memorizing the Gita what about memorizing the entire Mahabharata That's I would, I would be love it. it if I could download it like the matrix mm. that'd be cool I'd love to have it in my head maybe Musk will come up with like a something for Neuralink Gita mm. actually I don't know if I'd love it I'm not sure yeah. yeah I don't know I knew a guy who could recite the Gita backwards it was awesome and forwards, but literally backwards. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> he could do it. JP was his name. Guy in Bombay. Anyway, but it's cool. I, I think it'd be it'd be neat so long as it didn't get in the way of that deeper gear where you go beyond words. Chandra Shakanyaya. 
Mm. I think that's important, you know? It's like you won't be satisfied with just a professorial knowledge of this stuff. No one will. And the only way to really get a taste of that deeper gear, in my opinion, is to get comfortable between 4 and 6 a.m. Because that's when it's like it's like the bottom of the personality comes out. It's mm-hmm. So strange. It's it's almost it's almost physical. The difference in the deeper capacity. There's some opening that happens in the early morning. It's the subtle intellect is how we understand it. But it's like they say that that's when the the veil is thinnest between heaven and earth. Somewhere some sonnet talks about that. I don't know. Um, at that time, it's it's like you can get a look at it, mm. a look that's not a look. It's not an intellectual thing, and that is the purpose of all the knowledge. So, if I could have all that knowledge in my head and just, you know, go through the file and find out this verse and that you know word and that etymology, I think it would be convenient to have mainly for explaining to other people. Um, But that's not the thing to spend time on. The thing to spend time on is to try to actually look in the direction that all these words are trying to get us to look. Mm. That's what matters. That's what makes a person truly spiritual, is to actually nati nati your way into Australia to connect mm-hmm. all of our dots you know a lot to reflect on and if any listener out there found any of this interesting or something to reflect on then as we've said before re- reflection is a hundred thousand times more powerful than listening so find time to to reflect on these things not just one in one ear out the other because it's just it's it's so meaningless even this conversation i'm going to be writing a handful of these things down to reflect on further thank you joseph and e-learning we always got to mention yes dude jump right get on the highway get on the if you're really interested there's nothing like the online course offered by the ashram and it's at our website yfyi.co at the vedanta world app also Mm -hmm. and people will think it's uh it's like a course with tests and and actually cheney wishes there were tests yeah. but it's literally <laughs> just a daily lecture yeah. served to your phone in your pocket could not be more convenient and uh man systematic uh versus these fun but eclectic conversations yeah thank you joseph thank you brother Woo! That episode was fantastic. And if you are digging yoga for your intellect and want to introduce this philosophy to your coworkers and your team, well, Joseph and I are down to come visit basically an in-person YFYI. Come visit with you and your team. In the same way that you might invite a yoga instructor for a team building event, we're willing to come to your office and talk to your team as well. We can do it over Zoom as well. It is, uh, it's whatever makes sense, but uh, we're even down to do it in person. And that is just in line with the mission of making this philosophy available and accessible to all those that seek it. Joseph and I would love to come talk with you and your team about yoga for your intellect. And that really comes from my perspective of running businesses for the last 15 years and just knowing, man, it was about 10 years ago I was running 50 person company led to a trip to the ER is drinking seven cups of coffee a day to try to stay on top of everything. Um, trip to the ER with a heart condition. Needless to say, it was a very, very stressful, extremely stressful time in life. And that business ultimately failed. And 10 years later, I sit here and, and get to have these conversations with, with Joseph while running two companies and, and a venture fund. Each day just feels like it's a hot knife through butter. I have not had a single day of stress in the last six, seven years of building 
multiple companies and, and multiple venture funds. It's truly remarkable, and I know that it's not me or the businesses that are different than 10 years ago, but it's my approach to each day and quite literally to the start to the day because every day starts with this philosophy for me. And we want to share it with your team. For me, it feels like an obligation of sorts and a loud siren saying that teams and companies around the globe need to hear this. So if you're interested, email us at, this is the key thing, email us at yoga for your intellect at gmail.com. That's yoga for your intellect at gmail.com. Use the email address in the show notes and we would love to come chat with you and your team.